Hi everybody, welcome to our AS Macro Revision webinar looking at the, uh, the concept of economic shocks and their impact on the economic cycle. So an economic shock is uh, something which happens from outside an economic system. It's an unexpected economic event and they can often have quite significant impacts on key macro objectives. Particularly for the UK actually because the United Kingdom is uh, closely integrated into the world economy and uh, global developments can often affect the economic fortunes of the UK in terms of inflation, of growth, of jobs, of investment, and the overall macroeconomic performance. Now, e uh, external shocks outside events can affect both aggregate demand, familiar C plus I plus G plus X minus M. They can affect aggregate supply, both in the short run and the long run. They can affect uh, the product markets, the market for particular goods and services, such as oil or steel or farming. They can certainly affect labour markets, both in terms of total employment, unemployment and the real wages of people in work. And as we've seen in the past recently, of course, those external shocks can have huge effects on financial markets, impacting on the supply of credit and also interest rates. The scale of an external shock will always vary from country to country and in terms of cause. I think a key point is that external shocks have quite a significant effect on confidence confidence, the animal spirits of, of individuals, of households and of businesses. Here's a picture showing the, uh, the UK economic cycle, the familiar cycle I hope. In orange, the level of GDP, seasonally adjusted uh, quarterly data there, with the recession in 2008-2009. The blue bit showing the quarter on quarter growth. So the UK economy has a cyclical pattern of course and uh, recently our growth has been fairly steady, fairly sustained, but Keep in mind that nothing can be taken for granted. There are always external shocks that can upset the equilibrium in an economy. We make a distinction between different types of shocks. We can, we, for example, we look at world demand shocks associated with an increase or a fall in spending and confidence overseas. We'll take the example in a minute. Uh, the Chinese economic slowdown will be a demand shock. There can be supply side uh, shocks affecting prices, uh, the global supply and prices of particular goods and services. For example, the recent fall in the, in the price of oil was a supply shock. And of course, we can get systemic financial shocks in banking and credit markets, uh, often reverberating right the way through the world financial system. Now, a key evaluation point, not every shock is negative. A lot of people associate the word shock with something bad. Uh, I might get an A star in economics and that would be a shock, but it would be a positive shock in the sense that uh, it's something that I wasn't expecting, but uh, was good for me. Likewise, advances in technology, maybe significant advances in the cutting edge of, of technology can be a positive supply shock to the world economy. And who would have thought less than two years ago we would have, uh, the United States would have made big progress in, in negotiations with Iran and the opening up, uh, certainly the start of a, a reform process and the opening up in the Cuban economy. So shocks can also be positive. Here are some examples of external shocks. Uh, some of them are the ones that have happened a few years ago, the global financial crisis, of course, which came to a climax in 2008, 2009. The Eurozone crisis, which has been with us for many years, actually. Volatile commodity prices from copper and rubber to oil and gas. The Chinese economic slowdown, which we'll look at in a second. To uh, other shocks, positive things like uh, the announcement of big international trade and investment deals. There can be policy shocks, currency devaluations and revaluations. World economy can be affected by extreme weather events, such as the, the, the consequences of El Nino. And also, of course, sadly, close to home recently in, in London and in Paris and in Brussels, we see the economic and geopolitical shocks that arise from acts of terrorism. So shocks are unexpected events which, uh, which can affect economic activity at a macro level. This chart's kind of important for what we're going to be talking about in the next few minutes, and that's to say that China is now a significant, important economy globally. By some estimates in 2015, it was the biggest economy in the world if you measure GDP adjusted for purchasing power parity. Uh, on other measures, China is the second biggest economy in the world, and Britain is fairly small, less than 3% of GDP of world output. But what happens in China will clearly have an external effect on the UK. Let's have a look at this uh, in a bit, bit more detail as part of this webinar. So here's the growth rate for China. And you can see that since 2007, China avoided recession when the world economy went into a downturn. But since 2010, their growth rate has been falling. Indeed, uh, the growth rate is now less than 7%. Now, could a Chinese slowdown bring about a recession? Would a, 
will a slowdown in the growth of the Chinese economy be enough to bring about an inward shift of demand in the UK sufficient to cause recession? Well, so much depends on the scale of our trade and investment relationships with China and also the impact of falling world commodity prices. Let's have a look at this in a bit more detail. When evaluating, evaluating the impact of a shock, it's good to think about direct effects, if you like, first round effects and second round or indirect effects on the particular economy. So we know that China slowed down in 2015 and is forecast to keep slowing in 2016. Now, that Chinese slowdown will have a direct effect on the British economy fairly quickly. That might affect trade flows, the value of exports and imports. It can have a second uh, direct effect in terms of investment flows, foreign, foreign direct investment coming into the UK from China, portfolio investment in housing and, and equities and bonds. It can certainly, if you've been following the debate about the steel industry at the moment, have a direct effect on jobs in the UK in industries directly affected such as steelmaking and related supply chain sectors. And the Chinese slowdown could also have a pretty direct immediate effect on the sterling yuan exchange rate, uh, providing, of course, that uh, this is uh, a fully flexible exchange rate where the currency can move. The, the second round effects, the indirect effects, are often even more powerful. So what happens to China will impact on world commodity prices, uh, the price of oil, the price of copper and other essential raw materials. Would a Chinese slowdown, for example, tip more countries into deflation? What would that do to the UK economy? A Chinese slowdown will impact on other nations with whom we trade a lot. For example, the Australian economy is highly dependent on Chinese growth. Would we be able to export as much to Australia if their economy slows down? There are wider issues, fears, for example, that a Chinese slowdown or a financial crisis could prompt another burst of protectionism with countries introducing tariffs alleging Chinese dumping. And it could also be the case that the Chinese slowdown could increase the volatility of foreign exchange. So what are we saying? We're saying that an external shock such as the Chinese slowdown can have direct and indirect effects on a country such as the UK. Here's a good example of uh, our trade relationships with China. We are exporting more, although notice that exports fell in 2015, an interesting sign. But the value of our imports from China has increased much, much, much more quickly. And uh, the gap is shown in blue here. We can see that our trade deficit with China has been rising most years. It's now over £25 billion a year. Now, when a country experiences a shock, the key thing really in terms of analysis and evaluation is their ability to absorb and respond to the shock. So the Chinese slowdown is essentially a deflationary shock in terms of global demand, falling commodity prices. But to what extent can the economy absorb a shock such as that? Well, there are lots of ways in which uh, shock absorbers can come into play. Pick out four here, monetary policy, fiscal policy, and, and two at the bottom, which are essentially about supply side flexibility. And if you've revised the three policies, monetary, fiscal and supply side, you'll get an idea for how countries can adapt and adjust when economic events happen. So, for example, the Bank of England, uh, well, if China slows down, the Bank of England might consider, might, cutting interest rates from current level of 0.5%, maybe down to 0.25% or even zero. Because it's unlikely they'd move to negative rates, as some countries have. They probably rely on expanding their quantitative easing programme. So there's a little bit of scope for monetary policy to respond to the Chinese slowdown. And you can see here that interest rates in the UK haven't changed since 2009. You can make, make a case for saying that the, the Chinese slowdown will just delay the next rise in interest rates. What about fiscal policy? Well, again, the fiscal policy isn't set in stone. And if China slows down and the growth rate of the UK uh, nudges a bit lower, let's say below 2%, then the government might adjust fiscal policy. For example, they might allow the automatic stabilisers to work. What this means is that uh, in a slowdown, tax revenues go down and welfare spending goes up, and that helps to automatically stabilise uh, growth of output. So Osborne and his team at the Treasury might decide to delay, for example, the, the aim of a balanced budget, citing global economic weakness as a factor. I think the two bits at the bottom are really quite important. The extent to which a country has flexible product and labour markets in order to adjust to a shock. And the UK is widely cited as having a fairly flexible labour market. 
although you can make a case for saying there's a disadvantage in terms of job security and low pay. But real wages are quite flexible. And uh, there's some evidence, for example, that more people in flexible contracts, short-term part-time working, for example. So there's a degree of flexibility, which is, is useful when economic conditions change. And flexible product markets is having in the economy businesses who are competitive, who, if the Chinese economy slows down, for example, can quickly switch their attention and their focus to other parts of the world where demand might be growing a bit more quickly. I think a really key absorber in a world of external shocks is the exchange rate. And uh, the UK has a floating exchange rate. This chart shows the annual average value of the pound against the euro. And notice what happened here in 2008 and 2009 when the demand shock of the global financial crisis hit. The pound depreciated quite sharply by more than 20%, not just against the euro, but against the dollar and a range of other currencies. Now that fall or depreciation in the exchange rate helped to absorb some of the shock of the global financial crisis. It wasn't enough to avoid for the UK to avoid recession, but in some sense we avoided depression as a result. So countries with floating exchange rates can sometimes have a, a more flexible response to an economic shock. When you're evaluating an economic shock, think about the size. A slowdown in China is not the same as a recession. That'd be a different ball game. Think about the scale. Is it, is it a, a shock affecting just a few countries or is it having a significant regional effect? The European Union crisis, for example. Or is it, is it a truly global factor? A big a halving of the price of oil. Think about the analysis. Think about what are the likely multiplier and accelerator effects. For example, if there's a loss of jobs in the steel industry. Is the shock more or less likely to be temporary and perhaps reversed in a year or two? Or is it a change in the, the sort of permanent feature of the landscape? In which case countries have, have more time to adjust, but they will have to adjust. Who gains? Who loses from a shock? To what extent is a shock good news for some people and some businesses and bad news for others? And to what extent can policy respond? To what extent can monetary and fiscal policy respond to a shock? And is that response likely to be effective? Does it work? I would argue, to finish with, that I think there are six key areas, six key policies that help countries avoid uh, some of the worst effects of external shocks. In other words, these are six good shock absorbers. One is having a floating exchange rate. Uh, in a floating exchange rate, if the economy weakens and if trade dips, then oftentimes the exchange rate falls and helps just to, just to take off some of the problems in terms of providing a boost to competitiveness. Second absorber is having the freedom to set and adjust your own monetary policy when conditions change. And I think in that sense, independence of the Bank of England outside the Eurozone is a positive. Really important to have a geographically and occupationally mobile workforce, a flexible labour force capable of changing in a fast moving, fast moving labour market. And it's really important to have domestic businesses that are competitive, not just in prize terms, but in non prize terms. When that is the case, demand is more resilient to fluctuating economic fortunes. Finally, I think it's important that economies are diversified. So countries which are heavily reliant, for example, on farming or tourism or construction or financial services, they are perhaps more at risk of an external shock. So good supply side policies which increase the diversification and the base, the width of the base of industries and sectors, and avoiding over-reliance on just a few industries is a really important shock absorber. And finally, it's important to go into downturns and things with a fairly strong fiscal position. Not always easy, as the UK governments find out. But, for example, Germany went into the global financial crisis period in a pretty good healthy fiscal position, and they were able to, to use policy quite actively. Many countries with strong balance of payment surpluses are building up sovereign wealth funds and stabilisation funds feel like a macroeconomic buffer stock. So when economic conditions deteriorate, they have the wherewithal to be able to inject money into the economy. So I think these are the key policies for shock absorption in a world where external shocks are becoming more frequent, both in, uh, on the demand side and the supply side of the economy, and of course a world of increasing financial instability. Okay, thank you.